So thank you all very much uh, for coming. We're delighted to see you all here. I hope you enjoyed the morning's terrific retrospective. We have lots more to do, including uh, this keynote session. My name is Devin Carbado. I am a professor of law here at UCLA and the Associate Vice Chancellor for Brewing X. My very limited role is to introduce the keynote speaker, and I'm positively delighted to do so. As many of you know, uh, Teiku Lee is a professor of law and political science at the University of California, Berkeley, where he is also the associate director of the Haas Institute. Professor Lee specializes in racial and ethnic politics, public opinion, political participation and behavior, social movements, and Asian American politics specifically. He has written a number of books. I can't possibly list them all in the limited time that I have. But I would like to give you the title of just a few of them so that you have a sense of the range of his scholarly engagements. Mobilizing Public Opinion, Transforming Politics, Transforming America, why Americans don't join the party, uh, and Asian American political participation. Significantly, each of these books intervene in very significant ways in central debates about race, about politics, about political participation, about citizenship, about inclusion, about equity, and about diversity. Professor Lee is currently co-editing the Oxford Handbook of Racial and Ethnic Politics in the United States, is the co-principal investigator of the 2008 to 2012 National um, Asian American Survey, uh, which I'm sure he'll reference, and is managing director of Asian American Decisions. He has served in various leadership, advisory, and consultative capacities, including the board of the American National Election Studies, uh, the board of the General Social Survey, the Council of the American Political Science Association, and the National Advisory Committee for none other than the US uh, Census Bureau. Prior to joining the Berkeley faculty, he was uh, an assistant professor in the Kennedy School at Harvard. Uh, Teku was born in South Korea, grew up in, among other places, rural Malaysia, Manhattan, and uh, suburban Detroit. I don't think anyone else will describe themselves in that way. He is a proud graduate of K-12 through public schools, the University of Michigan, where he earned his AB, Harvard, where he earned his MPP, and the University of Chicago, where he earned his PhD. That's an awful lot of degrees, if you ask me. I had the opportunity of um, interacting with Professor Lee when I taught at uh, Berkeley uh, last year. And I have to say, notwithstanding the very, very impressive biography that I just read, it understates in many ways its intellectual capacity his fundamental decency, and his profound commitment to social justice. Please join me then in welcoming Professor Teku Lee. Thank you. Thank you so much for that generous uh, introduction. Nobody has ever called me fundamentally decent before. <laughs> so if I take nothing else from today's conference, there's that. Uh, I'm going to read a little bit from a script for the first part of my talk, in part because I'm just uh, here from uh, DC and I haven't had a chance to memorize my lines yet, so I hope you'll excuse me if I occasionally look down at my uh, iPad. So I, I just wanted to start out by saying what a great personal honor it is to be invited to participate in this conference, and I wanted to thank, uh, thank uh, Jerry Kang, Devin Carvado, and the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for convening this really important event uh, in remembrance of the 25th anniversary of Saigu, the LA uprising. When I was flying over last night, I realized that um, you know, the 25th anniversary uh, of any event that's happening now means that it's an event that precedes the birth of a lot of this campus, if not most of this campus. It precedes the birth of, the birth of almost all your undergraduates and probably many of your um, graduate students as well. And so I think you know, beyond pulling together kind of old veterans uh, uh, like myself and, and like uh, Professors Carbado and Kang to, to think about the moment that we lived through, uh, it's also really important to have a convening like this to take this moment as a way of um, refocusing what is currently happening uh, 
um, in the United States uh, and on campuses like uh, UCLA, and I hope to try to make that uh, connection during the course of my talk here. Um, as I briefly mentioned, my talk is a little bit of a, a two-step dance, and the two steps are, I, I want to start with a little bit about my own personal experience in history, because in my view, a remembrance is not a remembrance if it's not personal at some level. Uh, and then move to share some of my uh, research findings uh, where I'm going to focus specifically on Korean Americans and I'll explain the, the reason why uh, I'm doing that, which is a part of the talk which is going to be a lot more awash in data. And in part that's because the envisioning the future part that we were invited as a framing for this uh, conference is something that as an empirical social scientist I do best when I'm awash in data, not, not just because I think data help to predict the future, but it helps to chart a map of where we might go, the places that uh, we might go together. Um, I also want to mention, I want to start with a little bit of personal context, not because I think my own story is that notable. I actually think it's very ordinary. And because it's very ordinary, I think it's, it's also important uh, uh, to share. For Korean Americans like myself, um, Saigu belongs to a special class of events. So when Koreans engage in collective memory making and collective history, we reserve a very special place for events that are so momentous that they are named by the date of the event. And in doing that, essentially, we're saying this event is so important that we don't think that any other event in our future should eclipse the momentousness of this particular event. And I think for a lot of Korean Americans, the LA uprising uh, on April 29th, 1992 was such an event. We, we mark the Sam Il movement, uh, March 1st, 1919, as one starting date for the Korean independence movement. We mark the Yukship movement uh, as a turning point in that independence movement with the uh, onset of student protests on uh, June 10th, 1926, and April 29th is that kind of event that marks uh, a turning point in the Korean American story in the United States that marks Korean Americans differently as democratic citizens uh, in the United States. Um, like thousands, hundreds of thousands of Korean Americans and many many more uh, Asian Pacific Islanders uh, and uh, Americans of all races and ethnicities. Um, I think April 29th profoundly uh, changed the path that we were on. And for me, the path that I was on in 1992 was already an errant one. So I was in the first year of a PhD program at the University of Chicago, uh, having just uh, quit medical school. So I had finished three years, this goes to uh, Devin's comment about being in school for too long. I had just finished three out of four years of a uh, MD degree at the University of Michigan, um, much to the horror and dismay of my parents. Um, I think I've committed two cardinal sins, maybe the two cardinal sins of uh, Korean American son of overachieving parents. So one is to have quit medical school, but preceding that to have been admitted to Harvard College but insisting on not going. Um, so I <laughs> prepared my parents early for a, a uh, many, many years of horror and disappointment. Um, <laughs> so there I was, uh, April 28th, 1992. And at that moment, I would say the fair description is I was living in the body of a person of color, but living with a mind of somebody who felt like color was uh, something to be dismissed, and that if you recognized racism, you had to figure out ways of trying to transcend your own race. That is essentially um, the kind of way in which I was negotiating race at that moment, before Saigu. So, I held to the belief that I think uh, W.E.B. Du Bois describes well in Dusk of Dawn, where he says the ultimate evil, in his view, was stupidity. And the cure for it was knowledge based on scientific investigation. 
And so I deeply believed in justice, but in my intellectual life, that belief in justice was reflected in my efforts to try to read John Rawls, Karl Marx, you know, Amartya Sen. And I deeply believed in justice in uh, the activist part of my life. I was involved in a lot of organizing, but that meant working for organizations like Oxfam America, um, the Nuclear Free Zone Movement, which for many of you in the 1980s may recognize that as a, a thing, um, Free South Africa Movement, the US out of Central America Movement. It was essentially a lot of causes that didn't have a lot to do with who I was and where I was uh, at that point in time, and that's because that was my firm belief about how to pursue justice at that point in time. And then the City of Angels lit up you know, in righteous anger against a broken system and against a history that seemed to refuse to bend towards justice. And at that moment, for me, it was impossible not to fundamentally question uh, and rethink everything that uh, I had been so kind of overweeningly sure about in terms of what justice was and what democracy was and what kind of fixed mental categories like the police, you know, or criminality or justified violence or civil disobedience. All those things fundamentally got shaken uh, by the events of uh, Saigu. So, you know, the LA uprising was what uh, the historian Thomas Holt uh, would call, uh, for many of us, uh, a moment of race marking. That's kind of an indelible fingerprint that comes to redefine your identity and shakes you from a previous path to a radically different one. Um, Holt describes how W. E. Du Bois, on a very ordinary day, uh, believing in, firm in his belief that the ultimate evil was stupidity, happens to walk upon the mutilated and tortured body of um, a lynched Sam Hose um, in the American South. And from that moment on, he fundamentally uh, rethinks what the role of race and what the role of racism is in uh, American social, political, and economic life. Um, and so too, I would, I would argue that for a lot of us, many of us were race marked as we watched the city of Los Angeles go up in flames as I watched my relatives struggle to protect you know, their life and their livelihoods. You know, as I wanted to be, while I was in Chicago in my living room, uh, among the many Koreans in LA who rushed to protect themselves uh, where the police would not. Uh, at the same time that I also you know, wanted to be among the many Angelinos who were raging in their collective fury against something, maybe anything. Um, and that led to small everyday consequences, which I think many of us in this room who lived back then could, could share, to change your life in small ways, like making eye contact or saying hello to somebody that you would previously choose to render invisible, and also longer-term consequences. In my case, was a shift from thinking that I wanted to pursue a life of the mind by engaging in a radically disembodied mode of philosophical inquiry to pursuing a life of mind through what I think of as a deep and dirty engagement with the world as it is. So to, to turn to history, to turn to data, and to turn to um, uh, analysis uh, of the world as it is. Um, so that's a lot of the context behind the kind of research that I'm sharing today. Um, I think it's important that that's, for me, an ordinary story. So this is not a story about the founding of you know, KYCC or Kiwa or engagement with the Korea Black Alliance or participation in Rebuild America, but I think these sorts of stories happen throughout this country as a result of a moment that we witnessed um, together. I think the last thing I want to mention here is that one reward, a constant reward of that pivot was to dis discover a new family, a new um, intellectual tribe of mine, if you will. Um, and I, I couldn't think about giving a talk here today without um, thinking about a long and very lovely 
friendship that developed uh, in Hyde Park, uh, Chicago, uh, out of the LA uprising uh, with Professor Mark Sawyer, who was a long-term professor uh, here at um, UCLA who uh, recently left us. And I, for those of you who know Mark, I know, uh, like me, you probably still profoundly miss him and are struggling to reckon with the fact that he's no longer with us and maybe uh, angry about it. Um, but I feel um, very blessed to have had that uh, relationship and that is one of many kinds of uh, relationships that I think would not have been possible but for having a moment that insists on people breaking through uh, boundaries that they have uh, kept to for reasons uh, no better than uh, ignorance and uh, fear and uncertainty. Um, so the one consequence of this kind of shift for, for me is um, discovering this community in which I think there's been just a, a profound sh a shift in the kind of data that we have on what is happening with communities of color uh, and with marginalized communities uh, in the United States in the last uh, generation or two. And to that end, I would just share a point that, um, are you a, a vice chancellor? Uh, that vice chancellor, uh, you know, sometimes you can say Jerry, but then sometimes you have to give like the full formal. Uh, that vice chancellor Kong made uh, this morning, which is that in a way, an event like this and the range of speakers that uh, you are all treated to, in, in some weird, uh, perverse way, would not have been possible, uh, but for the event uh, of uh, the LA uprising. I think moments like that really catapult people to different careers and allow for um, moments like this 25 years down the line. Um, if you could uh, turn on the PowerPoint, please. So I'm focusing on the data part, on the research part of my talk on Korean Americans. And obviously, I, I just want to say it's really important to say that Korean Americans are just one story here. The LA uprising is, is clearly a multiracial, multi-ethnic story. And we obviously need to lift up all stories. But in the time that I have here, I think I'm going to try to really properly lift up one story because when you really understand the context, uh, complexity, and with candor, um, depth of one story, I think that's really the right way to move forward and, and envision the future. So um, with that, I'm going to dive into my day job, which is to um, plow through a lot of demographic data and um, survey data. So first, I'm going to share a little bit about the demographic profile of Asian Americans for a lot of you, especially if you live in Los Angeles. Uh, this is all really familiar. This is kind of like the business card that I travel with are these next few sets of facts. But it's, it sets an important tone in which to, you can give some context behind a few specific demographic uh, facts about Korean Americans that I think are worth sharing. So this slide should not be new to uh, almost anybody, which is that Asian Americans have been growing as a community at a remarkably rapid pace. They were the fastest growing. This is a little bit of, you know, uh, interracial, interethnic competition here. I had to add that extra decimal point to show that Asian Americans <laughs> outpaced Latinos by a little bit in the last decade. And they did so as well between 1990 and 2000. But in, in any case, they're a dramatically fast-growing population. That dramatic rate of growth is expected to continue into the future. So the blue line is for Latinos, and um, the red line is for Asian Americans, such that we're projected to be a majority-minority uh, nation in your lifetimes, if you're students, I may not be around uh, to be there with you all, but, uh, but my children definitely, hopefully, will. And by 2050, uh, demographers expect that Asian Americans will be the largest 
immigrant group in the United States, and they will be roughly one out of every eight Americans. Right? So what has been true for us uh, for a while in California will be true of the nation um, within the next generation or two. Now in terms of Korean Americans, it's a slice of the pie. It's less than one slice if you're gonna cut the pizza eight ways. Um, there are a few specific things that I think are worth noting uh, in terms of demographically, what are the characteristics of the Korean American community? So the top few bars are not gonna be that surprising in terms of number, um, substantially over a million, still heavily foreign born, very highly educated, um, but then when you get a little bit further down, um, you see a few statistics that really start to disrupt the kind of model minority narrative that still gets applied in a kind of totalizing way to all Asian American groups, regardless of their actual lived uh, experiences. So it's still a community that is substantially um, limited English proficient. The median household income looks impressive except when you match it up to the educational attainment. So um, the amount of wages earned by Korean Americans is substantially below what you would predict based on their educational attainment. Um, their levels of um, lacking health insurance or under insurance is substantially higher than the national averages. 14% um, live below the poverty line. And when you look at seniors within the Asian American community, that figure is 20%. So those are uh, uh, at least numbers that are uh, in stark contrast to the shiny, happy model minority story that typically gets told. Another thing that is often missed as well with respect to Korean Americans is what is happening in terms of population growth. So in a way that's slightly different from the account for Asian Americans as a whole, Korean Americans, if you just look at their numbers, the numbers continue to grow. But if you look at the population growth in percentage from decade to decade, the rate of population growth for the Korean American community is dramatically slowing. It's not as slow as it has been in the last couple of censuses for Japanese Americans, but it is clearly um, slowing. And the last thing I would mention in terms of demographics is we tend to think of Korean Americans as a community that is very heavily concentrated in a few large gateway cities like Los Angeles, uh, San Francisco, New York City. And it is true that when you look at the states with the largest sized Korean American population, they still tend to concentrate in a lot of states that we could probably <clears throat> you know, name if we were sitting at a table together and not under the influence of alcohol, right? We could probably come up with these names of states. Um, what may be surprising is if you, if you look at the states where the rate of population growth in that state of the Korean American community is the fastest, they're not in those states, right? So the story that has been told over the last couple of decades by sociologists of these new immigrant destinations, places that typically had not seen an immigrant had not seen, a Latino person had not seen, um, a Filipino person. That story is also true of uh, Korean Americans as well. They're becoming an increasingly dispersed community. Now what about the political profile? Because numbers alone, especially to a political scientist like me, do not have the same impact as numbers as they translate into political voice. One is in terms of Asian Americans as a whole, if you're gonna see dramatic population growth, you're also gonna start seeing dramatic growth in Asian Americans as a segment of the electorate. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna read through each of those bullet points, but they essentially make the case that this is a group that is rapidly emerging as a political entity in American uh, electoral life. To make that point a bit clearer, I'm gonna show a few findings that still haven't drawn a lot of attention. Uh, and in part, because I think we're all still trying to we're all still reeling from the November election and trying to regain our balance. So um, here's one thing that really didn't draw a whole lot of notice. So um, there were early results in uh, last summer about which groups were getting registered to vote at the highest rates and how much those rates changed from 2012. And there's one group among the four that are featured in this story where the rates of increase in voter registration are remarkably high and that was Asian Americans. And on the other side of that, 
um, catalyst here, which is a large uh, kind of um, survey vendor, sample vendor, which keeps these kind of large uh, 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 big data uh, bases on voters. They put out a, a white paper report in December about um, turnout in the 2016 election. And uh, I would say almost all of the media coverage of their report was uh, a story that you have probably heard before, which is that uh, white, more well-educated, uh, middle-class voters didn't show up in 2016, and white, less well-educated, working-class voters showed up in numbers that we haven't seen in a long time in 2016. Um, the, once, the one picture which they didn't show uh, and which I didn't see any media coverage on is the differences in, race, in turnout by race. So the, the story of white voters of um, kind of cancel each other out. So when you look at white voters as a group, not too much difference between 2012 and 2016. There's one group where the turnout rate really seems to have jumped in 2016 as a group, uh, and that's Asian Americans. So I could show you the previous slide in terms of the rise in the voting eligible population, but this is really what's happening election to election with the Asian American community. The other important piece is that they're not just showing up but they're increasingly looking like a certain kind of voter. So if you look over time, these are exit poll data in terms of the democratic vote share of these different groups. And what you'll notice is African Americans have consistently voted at very high rates for democratic candidates. The white vote has consistently been much more split and favoring Republican presidential candidates. Uh, the Latino vote has, for the most part, tended to favor Democratic candidates with some changes from election to election, which I think have to do with bad quality exit poll data. <laughs> and then there's this one group where even if you account for bad quality exit poll data, it is pretty clear that Asian Americans as a group, only one in three uh, voted for Bill Clinton in 1992, and those numbers have really gone through a sea change so that in the last couple of elections, close to three out of four Asian Americans voted for Barack Obama's re-election in 2012 and Hillary Clinton's election in 2016. Now, for Korean Americans, the story is also quite similar. And here I'm starting to show some of our survey data, and these are pre-election surveys. So one interesting thing with Asian Americans is, unlike a lot of other voting groups, if you ask them before an election how they're gonna vote, a lot of people will say, I don't know, I'm not gonna tell you. <laughs> Um, but the two-way vote share for Korean American voters is quite dramatic, even across the three time periods that we've been conducting this uh, National Asian American Survey. In these years, there's clear partiality for people who are going to tell you how they're going to vote for the Democratic candidate. But in 2016, it really starts to jump out that Korean Americans are looking like a very Democratic segment of the electorate. We see this also when we compare, when we break down the Asian American vote by subgroups. Uh, in 2016, from our data, it looks like Korean Americans are not as democratic in their vote share as Asian Indians, but they are definitely up there among Asian American groups. This is the pre-election survey where, again, there's a pretty substantial chunk here that won't tell us how they voted. And you'll notice even in the post-election survey for people who said they've definitely voted, a, a pretty substantial number won't tell us how they voted, but uh, for Korean Americans, it's heavily favoring the Democratic candidate. So this is a group that is increasingly becoming a consistent partisan voter as a group. And you might ask why that's the case. I'm gonna show you a few different kind of viewpoints about why that might be the case. One is on the issues Asian Americans and Korean Americans tend to be with the Democratic Party. So whether you're talking about com compensatory wages in this uh, question, raising the minimum wage in this question, we also tested it out at $15 an hour, and the rates are pretty similar in terms of support. Whether you're talking about uh, the modified Bernie Sanders turned into Hillary Clinton proposal for making colleges a lot more affordable, or just a general commitment to, to do more to support public education, the rates of support are extremely high. You can look at immigration, 
and again, a very strong majority of Asian Americans today, and this has not always been the case, uh, take the more democratic side on immigration issues uh, and so on. Um, this last uh, slide on healthcare is interesting because we, we tried out uh, asking about healthcare in two different ways. One is the, um, these are essentially the Republican and the Democratic uh, Party's ways of framing healthcare reform. So if you frame it in terms of repealing Obamacare, um, a majority of Korean Americans say, okay, let's repeal this thing. But if you shift the narrative and ask about, uh, remind people that this actually has benefited a lot of Americans and what we should do is strengthen it, um, those numbers, again, uh, they flip and a strong majority of Korean Americans and all Asian Americans are supportive of it. So one thing is Korean Americans and Asian Americans tend to vote Democratic because they tend to align with the uh, preferences of one party over another party. There are some other things that are going on as well, and I'm gonna use these next two slides very selectively to make a key point. So this question tends to get asked in a lot of pre-election surveys because we wanna know what's on people's minds that you might not see uh, parties or candidates talking a whole lot about. So what's the most important thing facing the United States today? Um, Asian Americans, like a lot of Americans, in 2016 started mentioning race for the first time uh, in very high numbers. Typically, typically race relations and government itself being a problem are so far down on this list that they tend not to get reported out at all. Uh, in 2016, they started uh, being a pretty commonly mentioned most important problem facing the country. And if you look at the race relations bar, Korean Americans substantially more than any other Asian American group listed race relations as what they thought of as the most important problem facing uh, the country today. The other way to look at that is to ask people much more pointedly, how important is this particular issue in your decision to vote and who to vote for? And again, for, um, for Korean Americans, race relations uh, stands out more than it does for other Asian Americans as a really important issue in terms of how they were gonna vote. Okay. Turning to the social profile, which I think gives a little bit more texture to what is going on in the Korean American community and also why they are voting so heavily on the side of one uh, party. Um, this, these are, I should mention, very freshly analyzed data, and by freshly I mean on a six-hour flight last night. Um, these data were collected uh, after the 2016 election, and it's taken us until now to properly do all the coding and weighting and, and so on. So I would say these are provisional data. Our final numbers may look a little bit different, but I thought this was important enough to this um, uh, convening uh, to share out what we find here. Um, so in 2016, we asked uh, for the first time, uh, side by side, uh, three different ways of looking at uh, what is going on in the daily lived experience of uh, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. One is, have you experienced what we would call a major discrimination event in your lifetime? Two is, do you suffer day-to-day -day microaggressions as a result of who you are? Uh, and three is, what are, the, what are the economic challenges that you face day-to-day, -day, even if you're not able to name them and link them up either to microaggressions or a major discrimination event? So on the first, in terms of major discrimination events, um, on each one of these items, depending on whether you are a cup is half full or cup, cup is half empty person, you might think of this as a low number or a high number, but it's certainly not zero in terms of feeling like because of your being Asian American or your being Korean American, you were not uh, hired for a job, you were not promoted in that job, you were um, fired for unreasonable causes, you were uh, harassed by the police, um, and so on. When you accumulate them all together, 30% of Korean Americans have experienced at least one major discrimination event, and for all Asian Americans, the figure that we come up with is about 33%. And again, that 
might either be high or that might be low depending on what your priors are, but those are the numbers that we get. In terms of day-to-day -day microaggressions, we ask about a range of different kinds of day-to-day -day treatments. Um, the one that I argued the most strongly for as being one that might be quite specific to Asian Americans wound up being the one that was most commonly uh, listed as a day-to-day as a -day kind of um, issue that a lot of Asian Americans face, which is that people assume that you're very good at math, even though you might not be. Um, this is part of my lived experience. Um, so we go from that to uh, people mispronounce your name, people assume you to be a non-English speaker, you receive poorer service, you're assumed not to be creative, um, you are called names or insulted, you are threatened or harassed, you're treated with fear, you're treated as if um, you are dishonest. And you can give some shape to what this lived experience of Asian Americans might be by looking at um, these sets of items. When you accumulate them all together, 88% of Korean Americans report at least one experience of microaggression monthly, uh, and that comparative figure for all Asian Americans is slightly lower at 86%. And the third way we looked at this is in terms of just what the um, regular uh, kind of experience of being insecure about your economic uh, life, your economic standing is across a range of measures like have you saved, oops, sorry, uh, have you saved enough for retirement, healthcare costs, cost of college, paying off college loans, caring for the elderly, paying off your medical debt, quality of schools, issues related to getting uh, proper visas, getting bullied in schools, paying off mortgages, childcare costs, and paying off credit card debt. Again, these, these are important parts of the Asian American experience. These numbers are specific uh, to uh, Korean Americans. Um, these are important parts of the Asian American experience and the Korean American experience that you typically don't hear about. So I think for a lot of people, um, the fact that, you know, um, I don't know, 40% of Asian Americans are very worried about the cost of college would be a surprising um, fact. And uh, if you accumulate them together, 63% of Korean Americans experience at least one fairly or very serious uh, challenge. That number is actually substantially lower than the number we get for non-Koreans in our Asian American sample, which is about 81%. Finally, a really notable thing about Korean Americans by comparison to other Asian Americans is that they really buy the idea that there is a sense of we above and beyond um, what the levels that other uh, Asian groups feel. So. We ask about this in a number of ways. So th these numbers here are just for Korean Americans. So, but we asked it of all of our respondents. So what, if anything, do Asians in the United States share in common? Is it common political interests? Is it common economic interests? Is it a common culture? Uh, or is it a, a common race? And you might think that there are really important reasons uh, why the answer should be no to all four of these items. Uh, but it's interesting to note that for Korean Americans, 68% say that Asians, what they share, um, notwithstanding our kind of folk definitions of race as being somehow uh, embedded in perceived immutable characteristics, visible characteristics um, uh, of others, um, notwithstanding that, 68% of Korean Americans say what Asians overall in the United States share in common um, is race, racial definition. Um, if you put that up over time and compare uh, Korean Americans to other Asian American groups, again, as I mentioned, it's, it's notable that the rates that at which Korean Americans say what we share in common is a common race is significantly higher than that of other uh, Asian Americans. The other way that people like me look at this question is by really kind of honing in on what that actually means. So linked fate is one way that you can measure what that actually means, which is to say, when something happens to another person of Asian descent, do I think that affects me personally? You know, a, a perhaps controversial way of putting that question is, 
um, you know, when Peter Liang, the police officer in New York City, you know, becomes the only police officer who actually bears any consequences of police violence, how do I think about that as somebody who is committed to racial justice? Do I feel like that somehow affects me, or am I in solidarity with the general issue of police violence? When you ask that of Korean Americans, um, the rates at which Korean Americans believe in some kind of pan-ethnic linked fate, so that's the version where we ask, do you think what happens generally to other Asian Americans affects what happens to you, are substantially higher than the rates uh, for other Asian American groups. And also if you ask it in the ethnic version, which is, do you think generally what happens to other Korean Americans affects what happens to you, those rates are also higher than they are for other Asian groups. So, Korean Americans as a group tend to buy into this whole idea that there is some in-group solidarity. And if you've studied notions of race over in Korea, in some ways that might uh, make some sense to you, but that's a separate conversation which I'll, uh, I won't comment on for the moment. But um, this is an important thing to keep in mind uh, in the coming slides. Now the last piece, which is in red, because so far I've told a version of the where we've come from since 1992, which is kind of like a political version of you know, the Korean American male store owners standing on the rooftops of their stores with guns. It's like the political version of that is you start developing a strong political voice, you vote in higher numbers, you have a strong sense of racial group identity that undergirds your vote and so on. There's also a lot more work to be done, and there's a lot more trouble ahead. And I think it's really important to, at, a, at a convening like this to have full disclosure on what those range of issues uh, are. So one is um, Korean Americans may have a strong sense of group commonality, whether it's in terms of race or culture or economic interests or political interests. When it comes to having a sense of commonality with other racial groups, uh, the, de the degree of solidarity, the degree of cross-racial sol solidarity is a lot weaker. So if you look at the percent of Korean Americans who say that Asians have a, a lot in common with African Americans, Latinos, and whites, those numbers are pretty low. If you're more generous and you say, it means something to say that there are some shared political interests, those numbers get a lot higher. The one big change uh, in uh, these data, these are our 2016 uh, data that were just out, is that in, we've asked this question in 2008 and 2012, and in the two previous times we've asked this question, there has been a clear rank ordering in terms of which groups Asian Americans feel like they have the most in common uh, politically, and it goes this way. So in the past two surveys that we've asked this question, more Asian Americans feel like they have more in common politically with white Americans than they do um, with Latino Americans or African Americans. And at least this year, those differences are pretty flat as compared to the past. And you might imagine the 2016 election might set some kind of important context for that shift, if that's a real shift. Another way of looking at the challenges that lie ahead is in terms of how often, you know, now that we're 25 years past this defining moment, how often do we actually cross racial lines in our day-to-day -day interactions? On the left for Korean Americans, I think what's notable are these two. So um, Korean Americans are substantially less likely to say they spend a lot of their daily contact with African Americans and substantially more likely to say they spend a lot of their daily contact within their racial group. Um, those, those rates are higher by comparison if you look to the right as the rates for other Asian Americans. So we, if I apply a terrible invidious stereotype, there's something to this idea of being more insular. And then, um, a couple more things, again, uh, these should be taken with caution because of the fact that the analysis is relatively new, but we also asked about uh, 
negative uh, stereotypes. Uh, these are two of four stereotypes that we actually uh, tested. One is about uh, on a range of one to seven, whether or not you think that group is less intelligent or more intelligent, and whether or not you think that group is difficult to get along with or easygoing. And you, you can set a bar in terms of whether or not, as a group, you think a group tends to hold more negative than positive stereotyping at the value of four. And I think no matter how you cut at these data, Korean Americans are slightly, it's not hugely, but they're more likely to hold negative stereotypes of Latinos and African Americans uh, than are other Asian American groups. Uh, and that helps to tell you a little bit of what the challenges are. So even 25 years later, a lot of these stereotypes really persist. And the other kinds of stereotypes we test for are um, on whether or not a group tends to be um, prone to violence um, and whether or not a group is lazy or hardworking. And those numbers are probably going to be a lot like these numbers. And the important point here is, uh, is what, what that's actually linked to. So these perceptions are linked to your perceptions about whether or not for, for African Americans and Latinos, these perceptions, these stereotypes are significantly linked to whether or not you think there's any political commonality with Latinos and African Americans, and they're significantly linked to whether or not you have any daily interactions with African Americans and Latinos. Finally, on an issue that has been a flashpoint in the past and that is almost sure to continue to be a flashpoint um, given legal challenges that are ongoing and the ways in which Asian Americans are used in those legal challenges. Here's the version of the story about Asian Americans and affirmative action that I've told in the past and that a lot of people like me tell, which is here's a clear case of cross-racial solidarity. You ask Asian Americans, are you supportive? Uh, do you favor or oppose affirmative action programs designed to help blacks, women, and other minorities get better jobs and education? And in this case, we asked it in four different ways. One is to just ask the general question. The other is to ask the question by naming it, by naming the program as affirmative action, because the idea is that when some people think about affirmative action, their brains turn off because they know that it's something they don't like. Uh, another is to give the stated you know, legal justification for such programs by noting that it's meant to promote diversity. And then the fourth is to combine the naming it as affirmative action and a diversity rationale together. And regardless of which of those you put up, the support levels are extremely high, right? Ranging from 75% to 82%. So this is the version of the story that people like to tell because it helps build community. It helps build community across racial lines and it helps us not think of affirmative action as a zero sum game uh, between people at institutions like UCLA. So here's the version of the, here are other versions of what public opinion among Asian Americans on affirmative action might look like, depending on how the issue is framed and what the narrative that we put forward is. And that has to do a lot with really starting to divide and conquer by identifying who the targeted beneficiaries of these policies are intended to be. So we, we did it in two ways. So one is, in this version of the question, we asked, so do you think affirmative action programs designed to increase the number of black and minority students on college campuses are a good thing or a bad thing, even if Asian American students are not likely to benefit from the program? And you already see immediately, so this is the number for all respondents, all Asian American respondents. What was in the, the mid-70s up to 80-something percent is now a bare majority. Right? So those numbers are already coming down. In the most recent survey that we conducted, we did more playing around with framing who the winners and losers of the policy are, and also attaching it to the Supreme Court rationale. And for Korean Americans in particular, um, there's a huge difference if you say that affirmative action is just intended to allow universities to increase the number of African American students only 36% of Korean Americans support the program and only 32% of 
other Asian American groups support that program. If you define it as a program that is allowed to let universities increase their numbers of black and Asian students, now 62% of Korean Americans like that policy. For other Asian American groups, that number increases uh, slightly to 38%. And then on the right, we tried to see if the fact of the Supreme Court backing it increases support. All these numbers are a lot lower uh, than the first slide that I show you, which were in the mid-70s up to 80%. And we have in this survey another um, version of an affirmative question that I'm not even going to share with all of you, because <laughs> the numbers are really low. And I think we're at a moment within the Asian American community where there's a lot of it there's a lot of difficult internal conversations that are happening about specific policy areas like this. And we also happen to be in a political moment as a country where there are a lot of temptations to divide ourselves up into smaller and smaller pieces on issues like affirmative action or any of the other issues that I discussed earlier in which there seem to be a very large degree of Asian American support for things like affordable colleges, compensatory wages, raising the minimum wage, and so on. So I think that's really the caution. A lot has changed in the last 25 years, but there's just so much more work that really needs to be done if we are really to make good on that moment that happened 25 years ago. So I think summing up, I would just say moments really do matter, and the fact of this event is an important reminder of that. When you look at one specific story out of 1992, the story of Korean Americans is that they are a dynamic community that is undergoing really dramatic demographic and political transformation. They're emerging as democratic voters, liberal across a range of issues, and they have a strong sense of group identity. At the same time, they face some really significant challenges, and the can we all get along is a long road still uh, ahead of us. Thank you. So, so we do have time for some questions. I think there are mics going about. Thank you for that uh, wonderful presentation. Um, you discussed the demographic trends, mm -hmm. uh, specifically uh, the increase in Asian American, the Asian American population. I would like your reaction to what has been happening in the White House in terms of demographics, in terms of the alt-right um, influence, Bannon, for example, in the White House, who really are talking seriously about promoting white European immigration to America uh, as opposed to brown skin, yellow skin uh, immigration. I'd like your reaction to this, and I'm particularly interested because my wife was born in China. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that question. I, you know, oftentimes, I would say before 2016, your first tendency as a academic when you get a question like that is to say, uh-oh, you know, I'm not supposed to be that partisan. But I feel like there's nothing, I feel like um, the sense of we transcends the worry about partisanship. I think there are real threats to cherished conceptions of, you know, why my parents left everything to, you know, leave Malaysia to come to the United States. You know, we, we immigrated when I was teenagers. You know, no easy task. Um, lots, millions of people come to the United States. They, they transcend borders, they transcend legal boundaries, and they come here for a particular conception of what it means to be American and what our system of government represents. And those things are being profoundly challenged and challenged in a way that doesn't, well, 
right now challenged in a way that exceeds my capacity to put it into words. Um, but I think that there are, there are clear and present dangers across so many different dimensions of ordinary life, and it is easy to get um, tired, it's easy to get frustrated, it is easy to um, take small successes along the way and imagine that the next four years are going to be like a series of those small wins. And, you know, I think the, the dangers are so pressing that really what we need to be doing, you know, are, I, I don't know, like in the law school, we should be thinking about um, what do we really know about the context of impeachment or, <laughs> Or, you know, I, I think, you know, I think community-based organizations, active advocacy groups should also be having these sorts of discussions. Like, how do we, how do we plan for regime change? Like, how do we, you know, negotiate this new kind of environment? I no longer think that's a really partisan way of interpreting what's going on. I just think that's a realistic fact and reason-based way of interpreting what's going on. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Cesar. I am uh, really grateful that you've presented on all this data. I'm working on a diversity committee at my job, and we're both, um, I, my coworker and I came today because we really wanted to bring a lot of the questions that you have in this survey back to our own law, law firm. So one of the things that I did see was, well, I wanted to know, how does your data highlight the differences between the generations like newer, newer, well, I mean, I guess older generations of first generation Korean immigrants who, you know, were the shopkeepers in what's it called, uh, Saigu, versus today, where, you know, you have, I mean, 25 year olds who are, you know, leading different racial ethnic divides, like what we see in Berkeley and like this past week, and how that was, you know, young students who were definitely engaging in those type of conversations. So I just want to know how does your data highlight? the differences between how we see the older generations versus the newer generations? Thanks for the question. So uh, on the measures of uh, major discrimination events, microaggression, economic um, security and vulnerability and so on, I actually haven't had a chance to really break down those kinds of data, but that's really important to do because I think the context of discrimination, the kinds of microaggression and the kinds of economic vulnerability um, that different communities face are likely to vary both by whether or not you are U.S. born or foreign born, but also what stage in, uh, in life uh, you happen to be in. You know, your, your question also invites me to mention one thing that I keep seeing uh, in some of my data analysis in terms of political engagement and the high rates of democratic voting among Korean Americans, which is that there is this kind of Saigu cohort so middle-aged Korean Americans like me look different in their political profile from what middle-aged people in general are supposed to look like. So you're supposed to be, you know, as liberal as you're going to be in your adult life when you are right around college or right out of college. And, you know, once all these burdens of, you know, life hit you, supposedly it makes you more conservative over time, right? So that's the general trend. I think for Korean Americans, you see a little bit of that, and then it bumps back up uh, in this cohort that experienced the LA uprising, and then it goes, and then it dips back down. Um, so that's just a, that's not what you asked about, but I think that's a curious share up. Hi, Esther Lee, Council of Korean Americans. So related to that, um, if you, have you looked at the differences in political elected officials across groups. So if you look at Indian Americans or South Asian Americans, um, they have had two governors, both of whom are Republican, um, and I think numerous members of Congress. Um, and in the Korean American, uh, we have not had one governor, we've had one member of Congress. Uh, and as a whole, Asian Americans are trending more democratic, as you said. So have you looked at those differences and why any hypotheses or research on why Asian Americans may be doing better on the Republican side? So I think it's really tempting. So I would say for Asian Americans, the numbers are so low overall 
that it's really tempting to make too much out of individual cases. So I think before there was Nikki Haley and Bobby Jindal in South Carolina and Louisiana, you know, there was Gary Locke in the state of Washington. And the idea was, it's kind of like Frank Sinatra in New York. Like if, you, if you're an Asian American person and you can make it in a very heavily majority non-Asian district, then you can make it anywhere, right? So the idea is that there must not be any political barriers to electoral success. And I think every, you know, every, it's, it kind of sounds like a dumb shtick for political scientists to say, but every election in some ways has its own specificity. If you look in the aggregate, here's a really striking uh, fact. There were a number of political scientists that collected data on gender and racial representation in the late 1990s. And they came up with what we call uh, par parity uh, indexes in terms of what the rate of electing um, uh, having electoral representation in your group is relative to the size of your group. And when you did those parity indexes, the one group that was far and above the lowest in their parity index were, were Asian Americans, um, who back then were about uh, four or five percent of the U.S. population and only one percent of all elected offices, both in uh, federal elected seats and also state and local elected seats. I have a graduate student that is updating that database to 2015. And in the interceding years, the population of Asian Americans has gone up, if you count the in combination, mixed race Asian Americans, up to about 7%. The needle hasn't moved at all in terms of descriptive representation. So it's still only about 1% of all federal elected offices and state and local electoral offices. So, you know, um, you can look at specific races. There's also a lot that is made of the recent electoral successes of Asian American women political candidates. And there's this whole discussion about whether, you know, in terms of intersectionality, Asian American women enjoy something like a double advantage instead of a double oppression. I think that's just making too much out of, you know, a very small increment, right? Because the overall story is still that 1% as opposed to 7% of the U.S. population. Well, I think that is part of the, that is part of the Gary Locke and Bobby Jindal and Nikki Haley story is a successful politician who has to win by winning a lot of votes that aren't people in your racially defined group have to do so by being able to cross those kinds of boundaries. I think that is clearly true, but that is one of several pathways to winning electoral office and one pathway of winning electoral office, which uh, for the most part has not been that successful Asian Americans is the kind where you build out of your group first and then you bring other people in as well. So um, can I ask a question? Yeah. So uh, great, uh, great talk, really interesting data, but part of understanding the data would require me to understand better uh, some baseline information. So when yeah. you give the interesting data about whether you've suffered discrimination subjectively uh, perceived or whether you suffer microaggressions, it would be really interesting to see if those numbers look radically different for say mm -hmm. Latinos or African Americans. Also when you say, look, do you have much in common with another group? It would also be really interesting to see if, again, those numbers look radically different uh, for African Americans and how they view either whites or you know, Asians generally, or for Latinos again. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, I don't mean for you to run through seven more slides or anything like that, mm -hmm. but if there's really interesting differences or is it more similar story where there could be a, a story of unrequited love, right? Yeah. That Asians see, again, whites as most in common, whites might see blacks as most common, blacks might see Latinos most in common, Latinos might see Asians most in common, and mm -hmm. there's no reciprocity. What do the baseline data look like, and would that help us understand some of the slides you showed? Yeah, so um, that's a great question. So for, for the way that people like me see reality, we see reality by asking people how they see their own reality through things like survey questions. And that can be really good in the sense that it validates people's own understanding of their experiences, but it could be noisy in terms of data because somebody might experience something um, that a law school professor would name as a major discrimination event, 
But if the person doesn't think of it that way, then it doesn't get counted. And there, there have been some uh, interesting differences by group on that score. So uh, one of my earliest uh, papers was using Los Angeles County survey data put out by the LA Times on experiences of discrimination in the early 1990s. And in those data, what was interesting is uh, African Americans were most likely at about 70% to have said they've experienced some kind of discrimination. Uh, but what surprised me was um, next after African Americans were Asian Americans uh, at about 50% who said that they had experienced some kind of discrimination. And uh, Latino, Latina uh, respondents from LA County I think it was only about 40% who said that they had experienced some kind of um, discrimination, and for whites it was substantially lower. That's one kind of baseline, but it's very contextualized to LA. One of the interesting trends in that way of measuring what's going on and how people perceive their daily experiences is the responses of white Americans in terms of their experiences of discrimination, which in, you know, in the 1980s, 1990s, you ask these measures and white Americans register at very low levels. Those numbers are now really high. They're about 40, 50%. And if you were, if you were to, I think there were a lot of tea leaves for scholars like me to have read, to have predicted the outcome of the 2016 election, which is always easy to do in hindsight. But if you look at changes in the percent of white Americans who say they had experienced a, dis a event that they would name as discrimination and the, the dramatic rate at which that has increased over time, that's one data point. The other key data point uh, goes to the question that I, I said a lot of pre-election polls ask, which is the question, what's the most important thing going on in the country right now? I've followed that trend since that question has been asked in the 19, I don't know, 40s. And you almost never see government mentioned as a really big thing that the country has to deal with. In 2015, on a couple of Gallup surveys, politics and government itself was the number one issue. It trumped racism, it trumped economics and jobs. The number one problem, according to more Americans than not, facing the country was politics itself. So I think you put those two things together and you get a sense of how turbulent the electorate was going into last year's election. Hi, Peter Huang, uh, CK Public Service intern. First of all, Professor, thank you so much for, for your speech. Um, I think it was encouraging for a lot of us to see a Korean American solidarity representing the data. Um, Korean Americans looking uh, and, and creating solidarity based off of common political and economic interests. But your research also pointed to, to uh, some potential fragmentation in the future. Um, geographic dispersion as Korean Americans settle in, in the South and the Southwest, traditionally socially conservative parts of the country. I think one of the previous questions was about um, some intergenerational fragmentation. Korean Americans, especially younger Korean Americans who experience events like uh, like, like, um, like Ferguson and, and, and New York protests differently than older generations do. And so my question is, in the data, once you start to disaggregate by, by generation and geography, do you still see that case for Korean American solidarity existing? And is that a trend that we'll see continue on in the future? That's a great question. So, you know, I think it exists when you, when you ask the kinds of questions that we do, but there are clear fissures, not just by uh, generation, but also by gender and class. I mean, I think like a lot of uh, communities in the last, I would say, couple of generations, the country as a whole has undergone a profound increase in inequality that is affecting us as a country, but it's also affecting all the different communities that we reside in. I mean, the the professoriate is more unequal today than it ever has been. And if I knew that the professoriate would be as unequal as it is today, I might have stayed in medical school, which, you know, like everybody's rich when they're a physician. But, you know, the idea of being a professor and having some people make the stratospheric amounts of money that they do and other people have to teach six to eight classes and, you know, barely be able to hold their own, I think that is that's a thing that's happened in the you know at last generation or so and you know i think for korean americans i think there is this professional class that's doing very well and then there are a lot of other korean americans 
I think part of what holds everything together is typically that kind of uh, inequality can be within a family, right? Um, but the longer we are in the United States as a, as a group, I think um, it'll be increasingly you know, um, divided between families and across generations and so on in a way that'll make it harder to maintain that level of, uh, of solidarity. Um, and I think you know, having, having strong institutions is always important. For Korean Americans, that's uh, often the church, but it's also things like ethnic media and so on. And if you can maintain those, um, people can move on and move up, but they can still stay rooted. Hi, Taehu. Uh, thank you so much for your leadership uh, on this. I wanted to ask a question about looking, uh, just revisiting this 25 years from now. Uh, so LA uprising 50 years from later, and um, it was I, don't, I, I identify as a person of color, and so it was a little revealing when you talked about how Korean Americans nationally look at their perceptions with blacks and Latinos, uh, and so I look at 2043 as kind of that tipping point, wondering whether or not people will align with being a person of color or a white or a non-color person. Um, so my question is, if we were to actually look at the composition of Los Angeles and the relationships that exist in Los Angeles, not the national data, but maybe the local data, would we be seeing points of unity where Korean Americans, Latinos, and African Americans, because of the uprising, have a commonality and form communities' interest to, uh, to protect communities of color? So you can comment on that. Yeah, I, I, I think your question, um I think the answer has to be yes. I mean, it, it, it's true that there are so many successful instances of cross-racial work happening today um, that I think in a way would not have happened had it not been for the common narrative that we have of, of Saiku and how to avoid you know, Saikus in the future. Um, that said, it's easy to be complacent. <laughs> you know, I think the, 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 if there's any um, thanks or gratitude uh, out of the 2016 election is that we, we can no longer afford to be complacent. And you know, complacency for me would have been to just show that first slide on affirmative action, right? You know, we're, we're, we're with all underrepresented minorities and so there is no zero sum game here an institution of, of higher education like Berkeley and, and UCLA when I think the reality is it's there. Um, and, and knowing the way in which it's there and knowing the kind of um, framing that people could give to what the privileges that come with going to Berkeley or going to UCLA are really helps to put us on a firm footing of reality in terms of figuring out how to, I mean, you can build a cross-racial coalition out of faith, or you can build it out of reality. And I would prefer to build it out of reality because I think that's going to be more durable. I told you at the outset that uh, my biographical sketch understated uh, Taiku Lee's intellectual <laughs> identity. I stand by my claim that he is fundamentally decent, and I think you understand <laughs> that he's committed to social justice. So please join me in thanking him very much. Thank you. So uh, we're just going to take a 15-minute uh, break, and then we'll transition to the next panel, which will focus more specifically on the contemporary moment. So 15-minute break.